All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Jason Peterson. I own and operate Woodstock Hemp Company. Uh, we're a hemp farm located in the Willamette Valley out of uh, Molala, Oregon. And uh, owned and operated that for the, since hemp became legal. Uh, we started you know, small, like probably all of you did. Uh, my background was indoor cannabis cultivation, so I worked on the medical marijuana side for a number of years, growing uh, indoors and in greenhouses, and um, was I really enjoyed that. Like I, I loved, I loved growing weed. It was awesome, and I was really good at it. And uh, eventually, the market started the tank, and I was actually kind of getting burnt out of being under the lights all day, every day. And so, uh, when hemp became legal, I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to kind of pivot, diversify, and get outdoors. So my parents had a 26-acre farm in Beaver Creek, and decided to take you know one and a half acres of their property and, and do uh, hemp with it. And so they were all on board and. Uh, that first year, you know, my brother and I drove to Colorado, grabbed our genetics, came back, and, uh, you know, we did okay. We didn't, I don't think we really made any money, but, you know, we learned a lot that first year, made a lot of mistakes, um, and then uh, and slowly started to grow year after year. So the next year we did uh, four acres, and then we did eight acres, and then now uh, own and operate, like I said, a 41-acre farm in Malala, and then another two-acre farm off-site that we do strictly for uh, flour, more like boutique stuff. I'm also the project manager and hemp specialist for an Australian agricultural technologies company. So they do soil moisture monitoring probes. They do infrared aerial analysis for fields looking for um, bad spots in soil. Uh, we Last year we did some testing of infrared technology to try and find uh, male plants to see if they gave off a different IR signature than female plants when they started to flower. And uh, we learned that they don't. But uh, they had a 500-acre farm out in Central Oregon that I was the project manager and lead for, so I managed that, which was really my first um, big experience into, into large-scale agricultural um, and agronomics. So they uh, operate 100,000 acres of farmland in Washington and Idaho, uh, mostly potatoes, onions, and they really wanted to get into the hemp space. And so really what they brought to the table was uh, large-scale ag experience, and they needed someone that knew the hemp plant. So together we formed that project and um, did really well with it last year. We're going to do another year this year, and we've got plans to do uh, even bigger uh, the year after. So um, a lot of opportunity in the hemp space if you know what you're doing and you can do it well and you can get your costs down uh, really low because really that's what this has become just like everything else um, it's it's farming and so in order to be competitive you've got to be able to do it cheap you've got to be able to do it well and no longer are the days where you could you know grow 1500 pounds an acre and have a six percent crop and make money like that's just not going to happen so you know if you're not making 2,000 pounds an acre and your biomass isn't 10 percent then you shouldn't you know you're not going to make any money like the fact is you're not going to be around so I designed this kind of four-part series um, really around um, the structure and the framework that I did for the logical cropping group, kind of laying out everything that they needed to know and understand, um, starting with you know pre-planting uh, being this session here, and then going on to the planting stage, and then we go on to growth and maintenance, um, and then finally harvest. And so what um, I you know basically just a, an ABCs 101 on um, on everything that they need to do and needed to do to be successful. And a lot of stuff is going to be, you know, you're going to be, well, that's pretty obvious, right? Like, I need to get a permit. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in here that maybe you don't think about or don't know because you hadn't had a chance. You've only seen it one way. And so what I'm going to present to you guys today are just a, different, a lot of different ways to look at things and understand the difference between some of these factors and why they may be important to kind of give you a more holistic view of farming in general um, to help you be able to anticipate and kind of mitigate some risks and hopefully save yourselves a lot of time and hassle and money and of course you know be successful like that's you know why we got into this we enjoy farming um, but we can't do it if we're not making any money so um, that's what these sessions are designed to do uh, so if you guys have any questions um, during the series please like raise your hand let me know I'll have you come up to the mic um, and then afterwards more than happy to take like one-on-one -on -one questions uh, and, and and do all that so um, So go ahead and dive right in. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, there's really no substitute for doing your research. So you know, talk to your farmers, talk to extractors, take advantage of any opportunity and resources that you can find when you're figuring out how to plant, how to grow, harvest, dry, and sell your hemp crop. I'm going to present to you some different ways, but I mean, there's ways beyond even what I'm going to show you today that are perfectly fine and successful. And it's not like there's any one way to do it. It's just whatever works for you and the resources that you have at your disposal. Um, you know how big your farm is and so forth.
So, um, you know, again, I'm not trying to scare you off. You know, I invite everyone to try and get into it, as, uh, get into farming hemp, because um, really nothing is, and to my opinion, like as rewarding as like standing out in your field in like September when you've got all those colas just kind of like waving in the breeze and it's sunset and you're just like, you're like I did that. Like that's that's really cool. So I get a kick out of it. I love it was one of my favorite parts, like ending every day, just kind of doing the loop around the fields and just sitting out and like staring over. Uh, in Powell Butte, you could see, you know, we could see all the three, the three sisters. There were some lakes. You could see Smith Rock from the farm. So it was like, it was a pretty epic spot to be. All right. So first things first, um, I'm just going to dive right in. I mean, really, like, budget. So, like, everybody has to have a budget. You have to know what all your, oper what all your input costs are going to be. Um, a lot of people oftentimes forget that you know once you harvest the plant like you still have costs that you're going to incur for probably two or three months after that like storage costs and labor costs and shipping costs and packaging costs and like all that stuff you need to like think about so i just can't stress you know how important it is to know your budget figure that out figure out what you're going to spend per acre because i've seen some farms spend as little as six thousand dollars an acre i've seen some farms spend fifteen thousand dollars an acre to grow to grow the same crop so it really just matters on what resources and methods you have at your availability um you know and again think about everything that you're going to have rent water electrical I know this last season I converted 64,000 square feet of barn space um, into, uh, there were old chicken barns, and we converted them to drying facilities. So we, uh, we had natural gas already plumbed in, so we just had to connect that, connect electricity. And uh, I didn't budget for the gas, and it ended up costing me for two months to heat these two barns, like $12,000, and uh, was something that like I just for whatever reason, it just totally skipped my mind to even budget that that in there. And uh, luckily, we saved, we had that kind of money and a little kitty fund because we didn't convert another barn. But it's just one of those things that like you just have to think about all that different stuff. Like, what's it going to cost me to have my electrician come out and connect three phase to my building? I mean, that's going to cost you probably ten thousand dollars right there. You got to get a transformer in because you're putting in a drying facility or an extractor. That's going to cost you a ton of money. So just make sure you go through and get all your estimates and write everything down. Um, And then, of course, always add 10% for anything anything that's going to be on there, right? Like, so, you know, farmers, in order for us to be successful anymore, it's going to be about lowering costs. So seeds, I mean, realistically, you shouldn't be spending more than a dollar per seed. That Those days are, are long gone anymore. I mean, you're not going to make any money if you're spending that much on a seed. And, you know, I know there's some really great genetics out there at that price. But if you can say if you're doing 100 acres and you can save 30 percent and you get a seed for you know 70 cents, you're going to save sixty thousand dollars right off the top, and so all that just starts coming into play. I mean, Oregon CBD, they're great. I know Seth and Eric, um, but there's a lot of genetics out there that are just that are going to put out as good as CBD numbers, as good a volume. What you know, they have some really good feminization rates and and um, really good germination rates, but there's a lot of other varieties out there too. So just do your research, you know, and, and if you're working with, um, you know, looking at seeds, because again, that's, that's a very you know, big onset upfront cost. Um, talk to a lot of different suppliers, get samples of their seeds. If they're willing to give, they should, anybody would be willing to give you a hundred seeds to germ them yourself and pop them to actually confirm what the germination rates are going to be. It's very easy to do. You just put some distilled water, put them in a bag, put them on your, on your windowsill. And within, you know, four or five days, you'll know. So again, it's just, it's just confirming everything that you've been told. I mean, don't take anybody's word at face value um, in this industry because there's a lot of people out there that are just looking to just looking to sell you stuff and really don't care if you're successful or not. So, um, so going on to uh, old scope. So here's a timeline um, that I created for kind of the, the logical cropping team, and basically it outlines all the different. Um, all the different processes that we're going to be doing here on this side. And we kind of color coordinate them as far as when they're going to be done. So this is a really good exercise and tool for you guys to create, to understand when you're going to be doing um, certain tasks and executables on your farm. So when do I need to buy seed? When do I need to do my field amendments? When do I need to do my soil analysis? And so you go through and you lay all this out. So you can start thinking in your head, all right, well, I need to start if you, if, if, you know, this week's gone, well, I only have one more week to get this done. And so you can start planning. Yes? Yeah, 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 they will. We're going to send out, like, an email um, to everyone that attended with, with all this information and stuff on it. So, um, yeah, and I can, yeah, so. Um, 
But again, it'll just help you kind of figure out when things need to be get done and help you keep you on track and then also keep track of all the tasks that you need to get done. So um, I also recommend like when I go through and do budgets for people, what I'll do is um, I'll figure out, all right, well, this, this three month window here. So from say, you know, January, February, March, it's going to cost me $25,000. Well, that's say that's my budget is a hundred thousand. So that's 25% of my of my costs. So I'll, I'll stagger people's budgets so that they know that they're spending, you know, 25% here, 50% maybe in the middle, and then the other 25% on the end. And it just kind of helps them allocate resources and understand like, if you've got business partners or anything like that, when you need to start having money delivered into the project. Because that, that can be a, a big deal for a lot of people is, is making sure they've got the funding to be able to do something when they need to do it. So next on that's going to be um, you know acquiring the permits, which is a pretty straightforward process. Um, I'm sure if you guys have done it already, you just know you go to the ODA website. They've lowered the cost um, this year. It's only 750 bucks instead of 1300 dollars like it was last year. So, uh, which you know of course every time they do that it makes it a little bit more affordable for us. Um, but uh, you know part of this acquiring permits is, is understanding where you're going to grow, uh, whether you're going to be doing it in the Willamette Valley or Central Oregon or Southern Oregon because each geographic zone is going to have its own um, challenges so and benefits too. So anybody doing in Central Oregon? Cool. So Central Oregon, you've got a, you can field dry, which is awesome. So it saves you a ton of time. You don't have to have a drying facility. You don't have to have barns to hang dry. It does put you a little bit more risk to weather because um, you can have you know hailstorms. You can have rain. You could have October of last year. We had these crazy bitter cold nights, six degrees, seven degrees, um, which really tanked and basically killed the plants almost immediately. I mean, they'll take a small frost, but they won't take six and seven degrees. Trust me, I know. Um, so it was really at that point like a rush to get everything down as quickly as possible. So, uh, but you don't have a lot of organics in the soil, right? So you're gonna have to maybe be adding some microbes, being added, uh, you know, some silage, stuff like that to kind of get those nutrient levels up. Um, if you're growing in the Willamette Valley, Great soil. Uh, we've got you know tons of organics, tons of nutrient content, but we've got moisture to deal with. So field drying isn't an option. So now you've got to look at um, having someone <coughs> come out and pick up your product and take it to a dryer, or hang your stuff in a barn, um, which can be you know very labor intensive, very expensive. And then you've got to figure out you know am I going to hand bucket? Am I going to combine harvest it at that point? So again, each zone has its own pros and cons. So it's important to understand what those are. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to harvest it in, in either zone, whether you're doing it in the Willamette Valley or doing it east of the Cascades. Um, you know, what I've found on the Willamette Valley side is uh, bean pickers work great and then taking them direct to a, a drying facility. So it's important to kind of, when you're figuring that stuff out, like think about um, you know, your CBD numbers. So that's basically what our what's going to determine the value of our crop. And so when you're looking at harvest methods, um, you want to know like, all right, well, if I combine harvest, I'm going to lose, you know, three to four, maybe five or five cents CBD. If I wet combine or if I use a, berry, a bean picker, I may only lose one or 2%. So I'm going to pick up, you know, maybe 3% CBD. Well, if my CBD is worth 50 cents a point or it's worth 70 cents a point, so there's a dollar fifty value there now that I have by going with a bean picker. Or maybe there's $2 of value now that I have with going with a bean picker over a, over a, uh, um, a combine. So if that drying cost me less than $2 a pound, well, I'm actually just making more money by doing it that way than I am by going with a combine. So it's important to, like I said, it just goes back to doing that budget and just understanding like what all those costs are and what the benefits are to those different processes. And you may not know, and that's kind of like why you're at the show and why you're, well, there's people downstairs trying to going to give you that information to help you kind of figure out what's going to be the best method to do. What are the pros and cons of doing it with a combine versus a bean picker or versus like a whole plant shop or something like that. So uh, that's what we're all here for. So again, you know, afterwards you got any questions or when, or when advice or anything like that, like, you know, speak to me, speak to people down on the floor. We'll, we'll tell you how it is because we've done it. We know, and um, or at least most of us do. Uh, so next on the list is purchasing seed. So, um, you know, like I said, like, you really shouldn't be spending any more than a dollar a seed. But most importantly, it's it's that you should be buying your seed from someone that is like a reputable, either you know authorized distributor or or they're growing their seeds themselves. And you know they've got a website. Like that's that's to me that's like the the base the fundamentals of being a, a, a reputable business is is you've got a website. I mean anybody can grow seed. It's not hard, but very few people can do it well. 
Um, I worked with a, a group this last season where they had actually produced seed. They're, they were contracting with a South, uh, South Carolina company to produce their seed for the last two years. And it was stellar, awesome genetics, really strong. Um, I grew them, I loved them. And then this year, this last year, they decided to do it themselves. And they harvested all the seeds themselves. They um, took them to the, the uh, nursery to have them germinated and they were selling sprouts. And they had like a 12% germination rate on their seeds. I mean, just, just entire greenhouses of just un unpopped trays. The nursery was pissed and all the seeds, you know, they, they were scrambling for me at the last minute, be like, hey, Jason, like, can you get us seeds? Because we don't have anything. We don't have any sprouts. We need, we need to get stuff for our customers. And uh, it's just, it's one of those things like, you know, you just, you have to know that the people you're doing business with know what they're doing. Like if you're working with, you know, like authorized seed distributors, ask to see the facility, ask for COAs, ask for a phylos test. It'll show you what the feminization rates are on these seeds. As for 100 seeds, so you can germinate them yourself to confirm that they are actually germinating at the rate that they say they are. Um, it's just, and that's and that's basic because if you spend all this time and energy and you don't get feminized seeds, uh, then you're you're done. You know, I mean, the fact is, like, you're not going to be able to make any money if your crop isn't all feminized. Um, the USDA rules, obviously, those are changing, so it's important to know that you know total to total THC is going to be the new standard for compliance. It's 0.3. Um, Realistically, if you're growing any sort of hemp variety from a reputable seed uh, supplier and their F1 genetics, there's no reason why it should ever be above 0.3 at compliance. So, um, unless you're, if it's if it's hotter than that, um, you're probably stressing the plant. I mean, I've never I've never met a grower that's grown it well and grown it properly and had them test hot. So, um, you know, as far as after harvest being over 0.3, that's a different story. But for compliance purposes, yeah, if you're growing seed from a reputable, reputable supplier, then they should never test hot. Um, the standard, the gold standard, really is one pound per plant of dried biomass as long as you get it in by you know mid June. Um, that's that's I mean, if you're not getting that number, um, then you probably need to be looking at your processes and your procedures and your farming practices. So um, you should be able to get a pound and a half if you're in by June one. So that's that's pretty that's pretty easy to do even with a with a mild chemigation fertigation strategy. Um, you know, high potency anymore is 18, 18 percent is pretty, is, is good. You know, I, um, if you're not getting 14 to 18 percent across your board on like your whole flower, um, then you should be looking at some, some, probably some different genetics. So, uh, cause once you start factoring in your combine harvesting or your bean, your, your chopping, um, you know, you're going to be probably down in that eight to eight to 10 range. And really 10 is kind of where you're going to want to be, um, to be successful. Um, so seed costs this year, in my opinion, they're going to be, they shouldn't, they should be 50 cents to a dollar a seed. Um, that should be this pretty stand. I wouldn't, pay, I wouldn't pay any more than a dollar, even for a CBG seed. I wouldn't pay it. Um, right now there really isn't a strong market, any market for CBG. So if you got people that are trying to push CBG seeds on you, um, I definitely would want them at the same price as a CBD variety. Uh, standard plant spacing, if you're doing like a, a beginning of June, it'll be a six by four. So you're looking at 1,850 seeds per acre. I always recommend buying an extra 10% to account for mortality rates, um, germination rates, and then any other errors that you may have in your planting practices. So um, especially if you're using mechanical transplanters, if you don't have enough guys like walking behind, uh, oftentimes you'll get, if you're putting water down in the hole, you'll get a, a sprout that'll that'll float, meaning it'll it'll float up to the top and won't seed in properly. So if you don't if you don't have enough QC behind those transplanters, then you're going to have that problem. You have to go back and, and replant some stock. So just make sure you've got that stock available to you um, to do that. Uh, and then make sure that you know again when you're purchasing seeds that you're asking your supplier if they're F1 or F2. So if you don't know what that is, like an F1 variety, um, it's going to have very little phenotypic. Um, change from plant to plant. So they're going to be as homogenous as possible while still being a, uh, an F1 variety and not being a clone. Um, F2, uh, you're going to have uh, eight times as many um, phenotypic variations. So you're going to have just a lot more variety in the field. You're going to have lots of different flowering rates, um, different you know bud structure, different plant structure, different growing rates. So if you want to have as homogenous a crop as possible, we want to go with an F1 variety. So just make sure that whatever seeds you're buying, um, ask them, you know, hey, are these F1s? And they'll be able to tell you whether they are or not. All right. So seed germination is next. So I, you know, I've done direct seeding. I, if, if you guys have any questions about it, like let me know. I, I tend not to touch on it in these in these subject in these sessions, just because most people don't do it. Most people go with sprouts. Um, but again, if, if direct seeding is something that you guys want to do, um, let me know. I'm more than happy to talk to you about it, kind of one on one. I highly recommend it if you're doing it into a pivot. 
Um, so like Central Oregon, we've got a lot of pivot watering systems because we do hay and alfalfa out there. So it's, it's, it works great. Um, but like I said, it typically isn't done in the Willamette Valley. But uh, not to say that it can't be. It just usually is not. So um, what we go over is, is planting from sprouts. So the key with you know planting sprouts is obviously working with a, a really good nursery that knows what they're doing, um, that has a really clean facility. Um, I work with one that does a lot of watermelon, uh, bell peppers, which are kind of actually in direct competition with our planting season. So um, it's just important to to talk to a nursery, find one early on, and just make sure that they've got the uh, the space uh, to be able to to handle your your, your sprouts. Um, I don't recommend going with anything smaller than a T one forty four. So if those are the uh, the tray sizes. Um, we, I did some T231s last year because the nursery I was working with had, was trying to push them. And I should have realized they were trying to push them because then they can get more seeds sprouted in the same amount of space and make some more money. Uh, they sprout just fine, but the, um, the root systems on them are just really small. And if you don't charge your beds properly, so if the beds aren't properly watered uh, or your drip tape lines aren't right on the plants, um, you can have you can run risks with the sprouts not getting enough water. So T144s are as small as I would ever recommend anybody going. Um, you've got a nice uh, uh, s uh, root structure still existent in that plant. Um, uh, 92s, 76s, obviously anything bigger than that is fine, but for mechanical transplanting, it's really difficult for those transplanters to handle uh, those bigger those those bigger cell sizes. So like a T144 is pretty standard if you're going with like a, a three-row mechanical transplanter or a one-row mechanical transplanter. If you're doing small acres and you're doing it by hand, definitely go with a, you know, a bigger sprout, bigger plant, um, just to try and optimize your yields. Does that all make sense to everybody? Any questions? Okay. Um, and a lot of nurseries now offer organic uh, germination services. So, you know, if you're doing anything organic from the seed standpoint, um, they'll, they should be able to provide that documentation for you guys and provide all those processes and procedures so you can get your, you know, your uh, USDA or your tilth certs uh, in line. Uh, germination costs, I mean, they shouldn't be any more than 25 cents a seed. All in, um, you should never pay any more than that, uh, even if it's organic. So if you've got someone that's, that says, oh, I'll germinate them for you, um, and they're charging, you know, 30, 35. I mean, I wouldn't, there's no reason to, to pay that. So uh, I, had a, I had a guy that was doing 50 cents a seed last year and these people needed it kind of last minute. So they went with him and, you know, the, the seeds that he delivered, the sprouts he delivered were just sad, puny little things. Um, so, you know, again, you, you, it, there's a lot of people that will try and take advantage of you, especially when that they know that you're in a crunch. Um, but just don't be afraid to get some pushback uh, or, you know, you know, my information will be here at the end of the show. So, I mean, I, I hate to see someone get hosed like that. So if, if, if you're in that situation, like, give me a call, send me an email or something, and I'll, I'll turn you on to somebody that can take care of you. Uh, and then a lot of nurseries, too, now will do delivery. So if you coordinate with them ahead of time and tell them when you want your plants delivered, they will deliver those right to your field when you need them. I always recommend delivering plants a week before so they have a chance to harden off acclimate to the climate in which you're going to be introducing them to, give you a chance to quarantine them so that you can spray them with, um, you know, maybe like a neem oil or a three-in-one, give them some fish emulsion, um, something so that they can kind of perk up a little bit, they can get a little bit of a shock in the transport and, uh, and acclimate and just and give them, and a vitamin B um, injection too is really good. That way they, they go into less transplant shock uh, right when you put them into the dirt. So again, vitamin B, uh, a fish emulsion, and then like a, a three-in-one um, in neem oil, cottonseed oil, something like that that's going to kill any aphids or mites that may, have, that may be on them. But again, if you're using a reputable nursery, they shouldn't have that problem at all. But just something that you need to make sure you're taking care of. Uh, next on the list is soil amendment, um, field prep. Um, yeah. As far as? No, nah, we just do direct soil. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll go into like a heated, I mean, the nursery I use, they, they put them into a, a heated chamber for the first 72 hours, and then they just, and then they go out into the greenhouses. So, and I, I mean, they do, you know, all, all the seeds I usually do are 95% germ rate, and I think last year we were at 92.5 to 94.5, like across the board. So, and with the 10% extra that we, that we plant, like we were well over 100% to account for mortality and everything. No, so they would go into like an indoor room. So they basically go into a room where it was a heated environment for 72 hours um, to accelerate the, the germ process. And then as soon as they popped, then they would go out into the greenhouses. No, 
No, just no. No, you're good. Yes. Did you want to get on the mic? Uh, yeah, for small scale growers, have, do you have any experience or heard of guys using the heat mats like you would for vegetables, germinating vegetables? Yeah, you can. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of what the, the nursery that I use, they use that heated room to accelerate that process. Um, it's unnecessary if you're, you know, I mean, if you've got time on your side, right? Like they're turning and burning plants. So their objective is to get them, um, you know, into the dirt, popped as quickly as possible, and then get them out into the greenhouses. So if you're a small, you know, small individual, it, it isn't, I mean, you can, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not necessary. Like understanding why they do it that way. So, I mean, it's, it, if it, it shouldn't improve your germination rates at all as long as you, the, the overall environment that you have them in is accurate. So, so, you know, soil temps can't be below 60 degrees. They're not going to pop uh, if that's the case. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so soil analysis, field prep, and amendment. Um, you know, get that done as soon as you can. Uh, it was over in Central Oregon last year, and it was March when we were walking the fields, and there was, like, a foot of snow on the ground still. So we were having to, like, dig into, like, some frozen dirt, which was a real pain in the ass. So just get it done as soon as you can. Um, go out in your field, you know, depending on how many acres you've got. You know, take a half dozen samples, um, six inches down, eight inches down, 12 inches down, and then, you know, blend those all together, and then uh, take them to a lab. There's a great one in, uh, in Tiger Tualatin. Um, I, the name escapes me, but I'll, I'll get it. Uh, but they do soil analysis, and they're cheap. And I mean, it's like 50 bucks. And they'll tell you what your CEC rating is. They'll tell you what your cation rating is. They'll tell you what your NPKs are, what your organics are, what your pH levels are. And they will literally build out a plan to tell you like how much of what you need to add into your field uh, to get it to the levels that it needs to be at. So um, I highly recommend everybody do that. There's no reason not to. Um, you know, again, we want to make sure that we give the plants everything that they need. Um, they're very high consumers of nitrogen, and oftentimes there is not enough nitrogen in the soil, either in uh, the west of the Cascades or east of the Cascades, for, for plant development. So, um, you know, definitely make sure that you get those soil analysis done uh, early. Same thing with water. You know, we want to know what our pH levels of, are in our water. We want to know if we have any heavy metals in our water, because um, that's going to, you know, dictate what we need to do if we need to put filters in, sand filtration systems, reverse osmosis systems. So, you know, understanding every aspect and every metric that we're introducing into the plant um, is important, crucial. Um, so, you know, following up with that, like I said, if you do the soil analysis, from there you'll be able to determine what your fertigation plan is going to be. I mean, you may be able to add everything that you need to add to your for your plant, like directly into the soil, and that's the best way to do it, in my opinion, and not having to do like a liquid um, chem plan on the back end. Uh, you can obviously, but if you can add it beforehand and have everything there in the soil already, um, in my opinion, that's the best way to go. So it just creates an added buffer in case you do have any systems with your irrigation or your chemigation strategy later on. You know that they're still getting everything that they need. So I will sometimes at the end like add some, you know, add put some PK uh, through the uh, the inline system if I'm doing drip or overhead watering, um, especially toward you know towards bloom, just to make sure to give them that kick so that they go right in the flower. Um, and then uh, yeah, make sure that you know that you're amending your field properly. So this was a small two acre field that we had done. It was all it was just a pasture field prior, um, but we want to make sure that you know that your dirt size, you know, you don't have any clumps that are more than you know a half inch, three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, we want everything to be nice and and um, and filmy. So you know, make sure you're you know tilling, disking, rowing. Uh, make sure you're doing all of that and starting from a great uh, great uh, soil structure first. So no sod clumps, any of that. It's just going to make it difficult to, you know, lay your beds and lay your drip tape. And, and at the end of the day, like, take pride in your field. Like, you want your rows to be nice and straight. You want your mounds to be nice and tight, you know, because it just, it, it just shows that, that if you're on top of that aspect, you're on top of every other aspect as well. Uh, irrigation systems. So um, anybody doing pivot or is everyone doing kind of drip tape and mulch? Okay. Yeah, so most people do drip tape and mulch, especially if you're in the Willamette Valley. Um, obviously, you know, we just don't have a lot of, uh, of overhead pivots out here. Um, the nice thing about drip tape and mulch is obviously we can use less water resources and we can deliver water directly to the, uh, the root zone and we're not watering all these weeds. Um, I like it as well, especially if you're using plastic, you know, you help increase your soil temperatures. So what that's going to allow is, is faster microbial growth. So you're going to have um, more of those microbes in the rhizome area of the root systems and uh, it's going to help the plants uptake nutrients better. Uh, and you're not what, you know, so you're, you're using less water, you're losing, using less fertilizer, uh, and you don't have to deal with weeds, which um, is a huge bonus for anyone that's ever had to, had to deal with those. Um, you know, there's a lot of really 
basic basic ways to design an irrigation system, um, whether you're pulling it from a ditch water, from a well. Um, I've ran small two acre um, two acre farms, uh, help people design them, just running it off their hose their hose uh, uh, bibs. You know, using timers and PVC pipe, you can you can do two acres off of a single hose bib. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to go about doing it from, you know, small scale to big scale. But, um, you know, I definitely recommend, you know, the mulch plastic drip is the most efficient way by far. Um, you're going to lose, you know, a few, uh, smallest amount of water due to evaporation. And you're going to add yourself a really nice buffer. Like if your irrigation system goes down uh, and you've got plenty of, uh, you're going to probably have an extra week uh, of allowable watering time in there to fix your problem than if you had an open bed where the, the moisture could just evaporate. So... Uh, Clearwater, if you guys are looking for resources, like Clearwater is a really great uh, company that does uh, irrigation design. Um, they're located uh, in Washington and Oregon, so highly recommend them if you're looking for kind of large, large scale operations. They do sand filtration systems, reverse osmosis, uh, reverse osmosis filters. Um, flood irrigation, I've seen it done very inefficient. I, I definitely don't recommend it. Um, I haven't seen any good production um, from that method. Uh, wheel lines, those do work, although only best with like an auto flower strain where you're not going to get the, a really uh, tall plant where you're only going to get, you know, 36 inches. Um, and then, of course, pivot works really well if you're doing it in Central Oregon. And, and if anyone has any questions about that, I can, I can help them uh, navigate that because it's a slightly different beast. So any questions about irrigation? Obviously, water rights being forced and foremost. Everyone make sure they have those. Um, yeah, so that pretty much, that kind of covers the, the quick and dirty of like the, the pre-planting uh, process. Um, so if you guys don't have any questions, then we're, we're good. Uh, come, if you have a question, come up to the mic. Uh, thank you, Jason. I just have a question on plastic versus ground cover. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen people growing hemp in ground cover? Um, without plastic, we did plastic this year, and we're thinking about uh, switching up. Why? Why would you? I'm just curious. Why? What are you guys looking at? Um, part of it's the the labor and the intensity of it for what we did this year. Um, we're a small farm, and just like plastic removal, it got frozen into the ground, and it was on fields that we were renting. Okay. Um, and so it was a rush to get it out uh, before that rental ended. Um, also, ground cover, just the the advantages of uh, building a microbial space for them. Um, are people doing that here in Oregon? Not on large, not on large scale. No, it's still mostly plastic. I mean, there's some stuff going into the, the bio, you know, the biodegradable plastic that we're seeing now, but, um, f for the cost standpoint, like ground cover still just really doesn't, I mean, people just aren't doing it. Okay. I'm not saying that you couldn't, um, but it's, it's probably, you know, you're probably splitting hairs as far as the difference between the two. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one thing you didn't mention was maybe checking, uh, the soil for pesticide residue. Absolutely. And so we, we did that this year and took it up to a lab in Portland, but um, that's one of the field men recommended that. We, we just used a Wilco fertilizer blend to throw down, you know. I'm like a Jack's bit. General or something? I don't know. A Wilco rep, rep oh, okay. had it. So we threw that down. Bambi recommended using them. But um, anyway, um, I, I would recommend make sure you get a really good uh, plastic machine. We used an old john deere one but it didn't work that good but the plastic machine is really a a key and like you talk about like clear water somebody to help you you know get the right you know because we have we had like an old blueberry system and it didn't work very good and you know it's sand filter kind of a problem you know oh, yeah. it didn't work right and it caused some problems out there and then also there you mentioned about rodents we had a lot of gophers out there. They're just having a heyday out there in our hemp field. Yeah, so and voles and, and mice, they'll chew through drip tape like nothing. They'll feast on it. So yeah. it, actually, if you're running your irrigation system, don't run it at night. Like try to avoid to run it at night if you can. Oh, really? Because okay. that's when they're most active. And so when they, they'll, they'll sense and they'll hear the water running through the drip lines, uh -huh. and they'll just, they'll just devour them. So yeah, I mean, wow. if you're doing that, and it's only in areas, right, where you're really susceptible to that. So Central Oregon, especially if you're doing it around hay fields, you got tons of mice, tons mm -hmm. of rodents, voles, mm -hmm. ground squirrels. Um, yeah, try and avoid running your irrigation system if you're doing drip at night at all costs, because that's when they're nocturnal, and that's when they're, I mean, they're just having a field day. Right. Pesticides, absolutely. As I said, soil analysis done, like the lab in 12th and that I use, they'll test for heavy metals, they'll test for all that stuff mm -hmm. um, to ensure that it's not already in your field. Uh, on the on the fertilizer part, uh, has anybody used any like um, chicken manure or anything like that out there to do like yeah. uh, 
Yeah, that, chicken uh, manure, silage, sludge. Yeah, um, I'm actually working with um, a gypsum recycler right now to develop. So we're taking spent biomass. So after post extracted biomass, mm -hmm. and we're taking that and blending it with the uh, gypsum because there's a lot of uh, calcium and sulfur in the gypsum. Mm -hmm. It also helps kind of aerate the soil a little bit. So really important here. We have a very clay heavy soil in the Willamette Valley. And so we're going to be introduced, actually I just sent it off yesterday to get the, the nutrient profile done on it, but it'll have Good. the old hemp product and the gypsum and then do that as a direct amendment to hopefully add some, some NPK back into the soil from, from the hemp crop that we just took out of it. Because hemp is going to pull up a ton of nitrogen with it. Mm -hmm. So if we can find a way to introduce that back in, then we don't have to, we don't have to do that with some other amendment. Well, one quick question. <laughs> We've got plastic out there still in the field. Has anybody come up with a way to get that up? It's all landfill, we... unfortunately. Huh? That, it's all landfill, unfortunately. So right, that's why. Right, if... but I mean, how to get it out, up? Oh, yeah, you know there's equipment. I mean? Yeah, there's, there's equipment. equipment out there to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe somebody can see me later. Uh, yeah, 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 come see me later. I've got one. Yeah, we yeah. don't have a lot of acres, but I mean, you got to get got to get that stuff out of there eventually. And and, uh, and maybe 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 you could talk a little bit sometime later, maybe about what the opportunities in the textile or you know, like you're talking about what. The, the residue that you have when you're left over, you know, what, what could you do Oh, with the uses that? for the, for the old biomass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stocks and stems are really, isn't much. I mean, from the fiber standpoint, they really want, they, you know, it's grown differently. It's really long strands. Mm -hmm. So if you go through like a combine or a hand or your hand bucking stuff, the, the stocks aren't going to be any good for that. So, I mean, realistically, right. you know, chip them and then just blend them and just mulch them back into your field. That's okay. probably the best thing that you could do with them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Emily Gogol, I run an organic hemp nursery. I want to thank you for all the great information you provide to the group, especially the early stuff on nursery work and how to work with nursery providers. I appreciate that. That's, <laughs> of course, the business I do for educating my clients. But I did have one question. Yeah. Um, you talked about having clients acclimate their plants before putting them out in the field. Yes. Maybe you could speak to some of the issues that, uh, in terms of needing the facility to do that. We just talked about gophers, about mice. Uh, we actually don't recommend. You said you mentioned a week. I just maybe if you could speak to like why you recommend a week and then the infrastructure folks are going to need because um, at least for our company our plants actually are ready to go out next day the way we condition them so I just maybe if you could speak a little more to it because if you are counseling folks to keep plants for a week if you could speak to how they should work with their nursery provider to make sure that's correct and then what their facility is going to need to to keep them for a week a absolutely no, that's, a, that's a very good point so um yeah to your comment like you know the plants that that they were coming from the willamette valley in a nursery environment and then going out into central oregon so a much different environment climate wise so, i mean even in may at the end of may when we were having plants delivered we were seeing temperatures down to the 34 degrees 36 degrees so it was important for us to be able to um you know have kind of temporary greenhouses built little structures in which they could keep them out of direct sunlight for that week so that, again we can quarantine them we can give them a vitamin b shot we can um, hit them with some fish emulsion and some um and you know a three-in-one kind of insect a natural organic insecticide um so that before we actually put them into the field but if your nursery is in the willamette valley and you're planting in the willamette valley good point i mean you, you really don't have to do that because the climate's the same so i guess i would argue that your nursery should condition the plants for you for your region and ship them ready to be transplanted so you don't have to build the infrastructure on your farm yeah they should the they should they should definitely harden them so off for you if they can and that's a conversation they, you know again work with your nursery as close as you can communicate with them where exactly they're going some obviously you guys are, are probably more willing to do that than others but uh yeah just be in communication the nursery because they're going to help you out and and inform you the best way to, to handle those little Great. babies thank you so much yeah kind of a mic hog um, <laughs> if anyone's interested we were we were um, new last year and we successfully grew without plastic and without fertigation if anyone wants to talk to me just to swap ideas and the idea of um, using a perennial ryegrass as a mulch and then to strip till and plant direct into that. Some of those ideas, Real Dale Institute, blah, blah, blah. If anyone just wants to chat about those things, I'm happy to chat. Cool. Where'd you guys, where'd you guys grow? Oh, Roseburg. Okay, yep. cool. And, uh, and my plug is Riverhawk Farm on Instagram. If you want nice. Look us, I got some videos and, and found, um, I'll just add, uh, I was looking for a bander to just band amendments, pelletized lime, pelletized fertilizer on top for top dressing. And that tool took me a long time to find on small scale, and I have a source for that, about 800 bucks. It's like a spreader bander unit. Does it just go on the back of like an ATV or something? Um, yeah, just a, that's just a small 20 horse category one tractor. Uh, it looks just like a, a broadcast spreader, but there's a little um, shroud that goes on it with a little spout. 
that you can just lay in a 20, 30 inch band of whatever on top of your beds. Nice. And okay. uh, that was really helpful for us. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Thanks for that. So my question, I'm, I'm out in Eastern Oregon, so I've got the ground squirrel problem like you, you yep, do in yep, Central Oregon. Yep. What do you do for control? <laughs> uh, so uh, you burn as much as you can prior to planting. So the idea is just to keep your, um, wherever the environment is, wherever their ecosystem is, keep that as far away from your field as possible. So go through, and if you've got any drainage ditches, just you know, weed whack those as much as you can. If you've got any rock piles, move your rock piles as far away from your fields as possible because ground squirrels, um, that's, where they will, that's where they will build their nests. So if you've got rock piles, get those out of there. Um, just clear as much brush as, as possible. So we would go through weekly rounds with our, with our tractors and our deck mowers and just basically mow the perimeters as much as we could to keep everything out. I mean, if you're doing any large, and we had 500 acres, so there was no way that we were going to be able to do an, uh, any sort of extermination plan um, prior. And this was, it was ground that hadn't ever been worked before. It was, uh, the, when I got hired on, we were planning to do 150 acres, and that was in March. And then uh, three weeks later in April, like 15th, they decided they want to go to the 500 acres and plant that in the same, you know, June 1. And uh, without bringing on any additional staff, it was like me and one other guy. And so uh, you can imagine, you can imagine like the the race it was at that point to try and to try and source the land. And we had six weeks to try and you know get leases signed, and then for another 350 acres, get our genetics, get them to the nursery, and then get our ground worked. So unfortunately, we weren't able to do all the things that we would have done had we known we were going to do that already. Like we would have done a lot of the upfront extermination work prior. Like I said, clearing out all the habitat. Um, going through, and if we had to put some bait, maybe some poisons or something like that around it, we would have done that too. Um, we're doing that now because we're able to, because we know what we're up against. But um, yeah, I think clearing the habitat's the, the biggest one. Okay, so I, I've gotten to the point where I've we've plowed. I got 19 and a half acres. We've got it plowed, got it dissed. I'm still picking rock, <laughs> but it was there was a lot of ground squirrel activity out there, and so now that I'm at that point. You know where where do I go from that? Because their environment's already been messed with. I'm just I know they're going to come back up in like two months. Yeah, um, talk to I mean just talk with the local exterminator on that one to see what they could recommend for you. Like I said, uh, the only thing that you can really do is just is just keep your activity around that area going as much as possible. So if you've already you've worked your field, you haven't laid your beds, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'd go through and I'd rework it every week. So okay. just keep your tractor going. That's gonna that's gonna disturb them enough that they're not gonna want to come back. Um, and then once you actually make your beds and then start planting, you're going to be active again in those fields. It's going to it's going to inhibit their return as much as possible until they're able to re until they relocate. I don't know what's around you, but eventually they will. They will just relocate to somewhere else because they're not going to want to. Probably to my other field that I want to work next. <laughs> <year>. <laughs> Hope me. <maybe. laughs>